Do we know what we're talking about? <laughs> Season three. Hi, I'm John Stevens. This is Matt Russell. This <laughs> and this is your pod at Mercy. So I've I've been reading this book about truth. Um, what is truth? Thank you, Pilot. Yes, <laughs> profound. <laughs> You know, it, it seems to me, and I am I thought today we'd talk about some of the stuff that's in this book about truth-telling um, mm. and, and what is now a post-truth world. Um, does it feel like we are, our culture, our society is very susceptible to lies? Yes. It does feel that very much so. This was a great podcast. Well, it, no, <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels like when you when we have words like truthiness or alternative facts or truth isn't truth. You know, truth isn't truth. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. I I think um, lies. You, there has to be truth in order for a lie to exist. Because philosophically, you know, I remember in, in one of my philosophy classes that you cannot lie unless you know the truth or else it wouldn't be a lie. Huh. Does that make sense? Yes. So a lie is not a lie. I mean, well, um, you can say lie, it could be mis, it could, if, if you have no knowledge of the truth, you can say something, but is it a lie? It's just what you believe mm. to be truth. Mm -hmm. Right? Does that make right. sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Right. So going around about. But um, if you go back to Genesis 3, right, what does the devil or the serpent say? He just puts a little variation mm -hmm. on the truth. Did, right? not, he twists did God not it. say? <laughs> I mean, didn't God say that you could eat from any tree in the garden? Um, and he said you'd die. It, you're not going to die, right? Not that you're not going to die. Um, one of the things I think is interesting is that there's three fundamental things that have taken truth away from us. Um, and this author talks about uh, confusion, deflection, and valuing data over facts. And I wanna talk about that. Cause like, the first thing you have to do is introduce confusion. And now I'm gonna describe this and you see if you've noticed this. Is it, Are these three things the things that kind of like put truth on like a quicksand <laughs> yeah exactly okay, okay yeah they deteriorate truth okay. so and this is what you say the first thing you do is you introduce confusion <laughs> right yeah well i know he said that but is that really what he meant i know they said that's true but i mean is that really true did god not say yeah okay. there's confusion yeah, so yeah. the first thing in order to erode truth is you have to introduce some confusion hmm. Right. Then what you do is um, you bring in, and usually confusion to talk about it's just minor deceptions. That's what that's what's really that's more effective is you take something that's true and you just twist it a little bit. There's just minor um, deceptions, and that makes the lie or the obfuscation of the truth more effective for your purposes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the deflection. And so we say, well, now we're confused about this. Is that what you really mean? But now we've made this unclear. And so we're gonna say, but look over there. I mean, you, you say blah, blah, blah about masks, but what about them? Yeah. He had a party, they didn't wear masks. Right. You say that's where well, the mayor of San Francisco didn't wear a mask, even though she has a mask many. So it's like, well, what about, so, well, hey, do you like what Trump did? Yeah, but look what he did over there. Hey, do you like what Biden did? Yeah, but look what he did over there. Deflection, right? Right. So confusion, deflection. And what deflection does is it cuts off the communication. Huh. So, huh. And so, it cuts off the curiosity, right? Yes. We're no longer talking. Communication's <laughs> gone. There's no communion. There's no relationship. Yeah, there's yeah, no complexity. You take yeah. the complexity away. Uh, Here's a great example, very controversial example. Um, Good. Co <laughs> yeah, well, we're on the podcast. We're going to do what we want to do. <coughs> this is not in the pulpit on Sunday morning. So if you're, if you're concerned about controversial stuff, so you just, just turn the turn podcast yeah. off. Yeah. <laughs> Don't send me a letter or an email. But um, because we're going to have honest, real conversations about some difficult things, which, yeah. which I think we wanted to do in this podcast, right? That's right? How faith intersects in this stuff. Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Right? So kneeling mm. for the national anthem. Yeah. All right. Uh, this happened actually years ago. It's continued on. It's become a really big uh, point of deflection because what are we 
what's happening? What's the conversation? What are we talking about? Well, Kaepernick was trying to communicate a message about uh, race, racial injustice, policing, right. equity, that, right? That's what the conversation was about. In his mind, it had nothing to do with disrespecting veterans or disrespecting the flag, but other people turned it into that. So that's a deflection, right? Mm -hmm. A deflection is he's dishonoring the United States of America. He's dishonoring the flag. And if you, know, if you wanna go back to the history of um, uh, United States of America, one of the things we did is we dishonored and disrespected the sovereignty of England Mm -hmm. in order to gain our own yeah, independence, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So American exceptionalism has to have some exceptions sometimes. For <laughs> that, it, it, that's the only way it works, <laughs> that's right, is right. exceptions. <laughs> Got to have exceptions. But, um, but what happens is now there's confusion, hmm. right? You've created confusion about the issue in deflection, right? Look what he's doing. It's all about disrespecting the flag. It's dif disrespecting uh, people who fought in the war. Now, all of a sudden, you can't have communication because right. it's already become about because something Because someone, someone who has insisted upon it mm. being about racial issues and policing issues is not gonna be able to have a conversation with someone who's insisted upon it being about disrespecting the flag or the military or the yeah. veterans or the yeah. country, right? Right. So they're having completely different conversations, completely different things. So they've lost communication, they've lost community, they've lost communion, right? Hmm. That's a big characteristic and you can point to anything uh, here we're just having an academic conversation about this and then so you've got confusion just watch this uh this if you want a case study just turn on cable news at night when the opinion heads start going yeah, any cable man news. they it, well yeah but i mean sometimes you can find news that's just hey i'm reporting the news although that's really hard to find anymore and so now it's all these opinions and talking heads and watch just just if you can be objective turn to all the different uh, ideological stations and listen to them hmm. listen how they introduce confusion right how these talking heads come on and they point deflection because you know they're going to have a, a liberal point, and a conservative point, you know they're going to have a yeah, point yeah. one point two right yeah. and they're going to they're going to deflect right and then all of a sudden they're yelling at each other they're not communicating there's no communion there's no shared understanding and the third thing he says that really works um, against tr is that we have replaced facts uh, with data uh. and what he means by that is journalism for example now is no longer about facts Remember the days when we were little and young, of course, before my time, but you remember Walter Cronkite. Um, that was more of your a time. A peer. He was a peer you're, of mine. You're way older I'm than I am. I'm super older than you. Yeah, way older <laughs> than I am. But um, I remember in, I think it was in college or maybe right around that time, when CNN first started right. and the first Iraq war was going. Right. And there was a guy named like Bernie Bernard Shaw. I think he's one of the uh, okay. the guys on the CNN. It okay. was like the news guy, right? Yeah. And it was just two, CNN was 24 hours a day of two people sitting there like reading the news. It was like local news at night. You yeah, know, yeah, it was yeah, all day. Yeah, they were yeah. just reading the news. Yeah. They were just giving me the facts. Well, we've got so-and-so on the ground. What's happening, right? It was no opinions. It was no any of that stuff. Nothing to be interpreted other than here's what's happening right <laughs> now. That was what they did. That's what journalism used to be. It used to be about the facts. But now, journalism is about mining data, gathering data, so assessing the data, polling. Every news network is polling, right? Right. Or they'll go out and they'll interview a certain group of people yeah, yeah. that kind of reinforces their thing. But polling is the new information. That becomes the new truth for us if we think it that way. So they'll say, well, 46% of the people approve of the president's, uh, you know, the job that the president is doing, but they don't ask, they don't help you understand what the reasons are why they approve or disapprove, hmm. you know? And so all the data leads to emotivism. It's all rooted in your feelings, right? <laughs> so if you look at, um, so and so percentage of people have had vaccines. So and so percentage of people are here in the country illegal. So and so percentage of people, whatever the the, the subject of the day, rather than have a, a, a complex conversation about 
all the both and pros, cons of whatever it yeah. is that's there. It goes into data that has to be interpreted that then brings up some emotional sentiment, which ironically, if you think about it, Jeff, <laughs> whoever invented the little uh, emoticons yeah. on Facebook and yeah. social media, yeah. they were way ahead of the curve on this thing. Oh, yeah. Right? You, I saw an interview of that guy. He rused the day. Mm -hmm. He invented the like and heart button for Facebook and Instagram because he said it created more division where he wanted to create unity. <laughs> but it's it's all emotional yeah. sentiment. Yeah. All right. So people put whatever in the world they want out on social media. But so truth. All right. Facts no longer have a place for us. Truth is now replaced by data collection. The mm. data is reported and we assess what we think it means. And that becomes truth whether it's factual or not whether it's rooted in anything factual or not and so basically opinion this so it, this is this is like um 101 sociological kind of like epistemology or right? whatever. just just watch How news just know. watch news pick your news channel right local news i think is a little different local news still to me is more about reporting the news. They have a reporter on site, they come yeah. back, they read yeah. the next story, they have a reporter on site. Yeah. But watch cable news. You yeah. know, yeah. the news, first off, the person sharing the news is very opinion laden. They're mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. uh, partisan, right? They typically are. Mm. And then they'll say, here's what's going on right now, blah, 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 A, B, C, D, E. Now we're joined by 15 different talking heads <laughs> who will all share now their opinions on the data that's in front of us. Right? Bring in the confusion, come on. <laughs> and so, yeah, and they go at each other. So it's all opinion, 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 opinion. So when you say, well, where are the facts? What's the truth? That's when you have someone like, you know, Rudy Giuliani that, that said, and I think he was right, and he says, truth isn't truth. And the guy was interviewing me, he goes, what do you mean truth isn't truth? Truth is truth. He goes, no, truth isn't truth. There's that guy's truth, and that guy's truth, and that guy's, well, he's not talking about truth. Yeah. He's talking about their opinion or their interpretation yeah. of, of whatever it is that they, um, and so all of this together puts truth into question. And when you put truth into question, you break down communication. When you break down communication, you lose communion. And that means you no longer are participating in another person's life with language, which mm. is how we communicate. Right, right, right. I've seen that happen a lot this past year. That's, that's fantastic. That's so, and that makes me um, realize that what we've done in so many ways is create two different realities Right, but each one of these realities may be multiple realities, but that in uh, the truth exists in one reality that does not exist in the other reality. I'm saying truth as in air quotes, the data, mm -hmm. data-driven ways of understanding. And so it's actually realities that are in clash with each other and unable to speak because they're invested in their own confusion, you know, the, the deflection, the deflection and then kind of the data stuff that supports all of that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we've, we've almost, we've almost created, we've created these two different realities that we're living out of. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. when you think about data to continue on and how that can get skewed and emotionally, think about any time there's a, an election coming up, whether it be presidential election, congressional election or whatever, depending on what newspaper you read or what news channel you watch, they'll have polling data flip it over to another you know ideological news channel yeah they'll have their own polling data right they won't be the same <laughs> so if you're only watching one channel you're going to get the data assessed mind gathered by whatever right and then they're going to tell you their opinions right, on that what right. that means and then you're going to listen to that and you got to go that's the facts jack yeah that's the truth. When I took statistics in uh, my PhD program, the, my professor said, be very careful with statistics because they um, can tell any story you want to depending on what you're asking, right? And so, like you're saying, those kinds of things can be easily manipulated. Uh, and you can already have an end goal in mind, he said. You just have to ask the right questions to compile your data to speak what you already think you know is the truth, mm -hmm. you know? It's a, yeah, slippery slope. So we live in a culture where truth is is being eroded. Um, we have a hard mm. time discovering what truth is, right? We, 
we say, I mean, what is truth? That's the question of Pilate. Pilate to Jesus. And I think, you know, what's happened is, is, you know, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. Well, that then what is truth? That the biggest thing for me, and I think about as a, as a pastor who preaches the gospel, when you go through some of the things we've been through around all these very difficult conversations in our country, you know, race or politics or pandemic or, or anything, they're very difficult things. We have people in different positions or points of view. And what happens is rather than us getting to a point where we have a shared set of facts, right, that we can point to, it's data. So, uh, someone will tell me, well, you know who the most unvaccinated people are? It's people of color. If you look at this, if you look at the statistics, right? Oh, you know that there's more white people who are arrested by the police than black people arrested by the police. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah. people pulling, it's data, 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 data. And so what happens is we, we have uh, this way where we're talking through across. Now, one of the things I think is mm. important is that for Christians, does truth matter? You know, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line as a pastor. It, is there truth? Yeah. What is truth? And does it matter that there's truth? Yeah. Because people uh. don't long for excellence, it seems, anymore. I would say everyone. You can long for excellence or you can long for effectiveness. Hmm. And what I mean by when I say excellence, I mean goodness. Yeah quality of yeah, character, yeah. right? Deep root system. Effectiveness is more utilitarian. Yeah. It's practice kind of make things happen. So what happened is if you long for excellence, if you long for goodness, if you long for righteousness, which are things that, that we learn and we teach uh, from scripture, then you're gonna have to have a love and a desire to seek truth. But if you are one who seeks effectiveness, right? Um, Utilitary, utility, right? From philosophical points, like what, what works for me to my benefit, then truth is not gonna be more powerful for you than power. Power is of more weight than Absolutely. truth. Absolutely, yes. Does yes. that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Because if, if you're using, if, let me see if it makes sense. If I'm using uh, uh, data-driven um, um, things called truth in the pursuit of power really is what I'm after, then that's going to drive me in a certain way, right? Yeah. Is, is that why there's a difference between that kind of construction that you're talking about and when, when, when the New Testament talks about the, you shall know the truth and it will set you free? There's a freedom that comes from another construction of truth that is, seems like maybe the gospel might talk about it some Yeah, point. so this is why um, politicians, hmm. and I, I don't care what party they yeah, are, yeah, yeah. they're all the same. You know why? Because is their highest value excellence in truth or effectiveness in power? And so hmm. what Plato said is that tyranny or tyrants are always gonna choose power and victory over truth. Heck yeah. And so when you say tyrant or tyranny, I would say anyone who longs for control, mm -hmm. longs to win. So when you look at our political system in the United States of America, and this is true of Republicans and Democrats, right? They wanna win. So if Republicans are in charge of a state and the census comes out and they get to draw the lines, they're gonna try to draw the sure. lines for their advantage the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. And if it's a democratic run state, they're gonna try to draw the lines for their advantage. Yeah, It's just the way it is, yeah. Yeah. right? Why? Because you wanna maintain power. So you look at like effective governing. We, people like, if you look at uh, people's uh, support or popularity of Congress, it's like, you think Trump or Biden's like performance rates are low or whatever. Congress. <laughs> Look at Congress. There's like 11% <laughs> people like, because they don't, they don't actually govern. It's almost like they're always blocking or always limiting. They're always trying to get in the way to right. disrupt. And, and my perception is they're always trying to wait to get to the next election, right? Right. Because again, it's oh. about power and victory. So once we've politicized it, or and, and I mean that in a in a grand sense, and we've created that, then we yield that as power. Is is the opposite of that that truth is a communal experience? That once we put it in relationships, and it's ultimately about discovery of each other, and maybe a collective world we live in. Does that 
you know, is that too? I think you got to talk about different ways because from, you know, if someone's not a Christian from a secular perspective, sure. they're going to understand or think about truth differently than if you are a Christian. Yeah. Right. So for us as a Christian, and I'm, I'm mainly speaking to people, I guess, who are Christian or people who are curious about how Christians should be acting or behaving. Yeah. For a Christian, the highest ideal should be truth, Excellent. not power, yeah. not yeah. victory. But if you go into the realm of, of politics, and I would say even in, in our country, this is a conversation I think that needs to be had mm. uh, more substantively yeah. because American Christians are listening in the pulpit. I mean, they're listening to their pastors in the pulpit and they're either, it's either reaffirming some political ideological position right. they have or it's countering it. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like the influence of the politics is being brought into the church and now I'm evaluating everything uh, I hear from the gospel through these lens of- It's just a big echo chain. Of, of the culture and the politics, right? right? And so that's what we, we mean when we're talking about um, you know, what is it that has a higher priority for us? Um, I would say Christians in America have lost uh, what the Bible values is, and calls wisdom, hmm. is groundedness. And so if you look at the wisdom of Moses as a leader, he wasn't, it wasn't wise in the sense that he was all powerful and perfect. He was human, he messed up, he, he, you know, he was frail, he's flawed. Um, and so I think in that, that, that we've lost wisdom. Mm. Um, and when you lose wisdom, if you have leaders that have no sense of history, okay, I don't care who they are, but when you lose a sense of history, you lose wisdom because the past has no voice in the current situation. And when the past has no voice into what we are dealing with now, then we only live in the moment for ourselves. That's, that's profound, right? Well, it's not that profound. No, no. I, I, well, I, I think this I, is why, as a, I was a history major, and so when you take historiography and you go through and you're pulling from primary sources and you're testing and you're challenging and you're trying to figure things out and then you're trying to apply it to like what does this mean for right. today, right? A liberal arts education kind of forces you to think and wrestle and say to yourself, I could be wrong about yes. this, right? Right. So when you look at the issues right. of race, you got to you got to take into context the history of our country. Yes to understand how we are where we are. Yeah. And with no sense of past, then right now I only see the issues of race from my own personal perspective. Right. right. Which is not good, <laughs> which I mean, maybe if I'm an enlightened person, that could be good, I could be open and listen to someone mm. else. Mm. But I could also be flawed in this. That's right. And think you're trying to take something from me or you're trying to ruin my country, you're trying to whatever you're trying to do. And then, um, you're just you're pulled out of it to where it becomes very much turned in on yourself. Mm. You only view any 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 issue is only viewed through my own personal feeling, yeah, emotional experience. It, and it seems like in a, from a psychological standpoint that ego stands in the center of that, unable to be kind of questioned, right? So we don't we don't enter into conversations where we're curious. We don't under under conversations where you did, like what you said. I'm holding this perspective. I could be wrong. What does it mean for me to me and my perspective not to be in a symbiotic relationship? They're just mm -hmm. like like squeezed up against each other. Yeah. Right? How do I pull that back to say, huh? I wonder if there's air for other um, um, other perspectives in that. So, if you if you ever studied Plato, you know in in the Republic he talks about how mass democracy okay. leads to tyranny. Okay. He was not okay. a big fan of mass democracy. And yeah. we don't actually have mass democracy. Yeah. We have a republic democracy. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. basically what we do is we go to the voting booths and we vote, right? Mm -hmm. And we vote people to represent us, representative yes. democracy to go to right. Washington or the state house or whatever else. So I'm not the governor, I'm not a senator, I'm not a representative, I'm not the president, but I vote for these people, we all vote for these people, and they go and they govern on behalf of right. me. Mass democracy is like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I'm coming and I'm gonna help have my, my say and you're gonna listen to me, mm. all right? So that's like when you go to the school board meeting, there's seven people that we've all elected, but this one woman or man or whomever is like, I'm suing you because I want an equal voice to you. Right. So that's mass That's mass democracy, uh, where now everyone has to be treated equally. Which undermines And democracy. Plato says that's tyranny. 
Wow. So what I would say is whether you're on the far right or the far left, and you like live into this mass democracy, where like the the little you yeah. know uh, small minority voices they sure. yell yeah. the loudest, yeah. da, 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 da. you know the woke side yeah. or the yeah. this side or whatever it yeah. is, and it's like oh we got to all cater to everybody on the far left. It's like you know the alt right or the woke left or whatever yeah, you want to yeah, call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's like that's Plato's like no 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 that's that's bull. Uh, yeah, that's crap. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. But in some ways, that's what we've we've allowed to uh, so to, to rise up in our culture. So how do we how do we reclaim if that's if that because I mean it seems like that what you're exegeting is like what's happening in uh, our context, right, in our society, and um and and I would suggest that truth is not just Christian truth. There's got to be a, a level of what it means to be human. We can engage within the truth, irregardless of our faith and i would hope that our christian faith would give us both the humility and some of the other capacities and tools to stand there and to cultivate that in a in a better way maybe than others well and you plato know, would tell you that so this is to be pre-christian plato would tell you socrates was struggling for that mm. to try to get them to understand why it is that they wanted the kind of society that they wanted because it was tyranny so he kept you know trying to get what's your motivation what's your motivation right, what's your right. motivation they finally just killed him and put 30 tyrants <laughs> in charge of the nation state because they didn't want to answer those questions anymore. They just wanted to be in control. And so it's looking at, you know, what's the reason behind uh, what's happening? But we don't, we don't look at that. It's easier to get froth, you know, frothed up in the, in the stuff that's going on. Um, truth though, has got to be found. It's necessary for a just society. It's necessary to avoid tyranny. Mm. Um, Another thing that's related to this that has been sort of front and center for me, and I think for us as a church, and I think this is appropriate whether you're in the church or not in the church, if you're someone who doesn't understand church, um, or if you are a Christian, this whole thing people talk about, and some people think it's laden with this negative connotation. It's called, they call it Christian nationalism, right? Where Christianity and the state start really start bleeding together. Right? Mm. And there's no lines drawn anymore. And um, basically Christianity looks for the state and the power of the state to defend the Christian faith. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is not new, by the way. This has been around since, what, the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, yeah, there yeah. was a guy named um, Rush Dooney. There's dominion, it's called dominion theology or the huh. seven mountain dominion. Okay. Have you ever heard of this? No. All right, so it's been around. So when you listen to these pastors who get up at these rallies and there's prosperity theology right. and it's flying the flag yeah. and it's all like, you know, they're like one and the same right. and the lines are so drawn. That's what this is, it's dominion theology. And so this helps us understand though why. Why would Christians vote for, I'm, I'm gonna use this and you're, it's gonna throw people off. Why would Christians vote for a guy who's been divorced, who's pro-abortion, right? Who lived out of wedlock, you know, uh, who lived in kind of, and, and really wasn't even a faithful church attender and never really a church church. Now people think I'm talking about Trump. I'm, I'm not talking about Trump, I'm talking about Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about Ronald Reagan. And so why, but why do, you know, conservatives have typically aligned with, you know, Republicans, uh, the religious right and all that, but why is it that Christians would choose flawed leaders that have all these things? Power. Hmm. Reagan was, Reagan was gonna win, It's gonna give power, you know? Hmm. I mean, Reagan only aligned with the religious right to gain the votes. Hmm. I mean, and it went back to the Bob Jones University was integration and they outlawed interracial dating yeah. in 1971, the Supreme Court case that came out about all this. And some Christian conservatives in that time will tell you that was far more disturbing for them than Roe v. Wade. Um, wow. And so when you look at all this stuff going on, it's like, wow. Um, and what happened, do you ever heard of a guy named Cal Thomas? No. So Cal Thomas was one of the religious right leaders in the okay. 80s, Jerry Falwell right. associate, yeah. Yeah. right? And he left the religious right because what he said was that the right, the Christian right movement is moving too much, is sort of cozying up too much and being seduced too much by the power mm. of the state. Mm. 
by the power of the government, by the seat at the table, and they've abandoned truth. Wow. And so, um, and what he said, look, Christian faith is about truth. And whenever you try to mix power and truth, mm. guess what wins? Mm. Mm. Power. Of course. Every time. And you give up your prophetic utterance, right? Because truth should be a prophetic utterance to any side, right? To every side, <laughs> right? Mm. And it's a call to relate differently to each other, not not one out of power. The, the, Paul has that whole concept in Philippians <clears throat> about uh, kenosis, about giving up of power mm -hmm. so that we might um, enter into a new way of relating together. You know, that um, that's the whole Philippians um, um, hymn about out, you know that that uh, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, yeah. but he gave up, mm -hmm. right? He he emptied himself, is what it says, and mm -hmm. that emptying, I mean, we realize is the summonsing of the Christian church, all of us, to empty ourselves out before God. And in that place, um, something happens, we say. A resurrection occurs, new life is, and whatever comes out of that emptied space. But I, I think that we're in a place, and I know that this, you know, whether that's personally in my own life or collectively, to be empty feels very scary. Hmm. To not have power, to be powerless, particularly in front of an ever-changing world, feels feels like you're asking you asking me to do too much god yeah so this is why we find the struggle between you know american christians how are we going to win mm. the culture war yeah. we're going to win by aligning with the power of the state yeah. by the power of the government by the yeah. power of the courts mm. and so we have to have the right judges or the right politicians or the right all of this and what happens is truth is going to lose out to that because power and effectiveness have to be the tools that you use to win that that battle right and so that's where that christian nationalism gets so intertwined and so in dominion theology when they talk about manifest destiny when they talk about the city on the hill the light the city on the hill they're talking about the united states of america that's not what the bible is referring to when it talks about a city on a right, hill right, right? It's talking about the city of god right and that's no geographic boundaries no nat national ethnicity or anything about that and so we're looking for religious freedom but the way christians are fighting for their religious freedom is by dominating other people mm. <laughs> so think about i want my religious freedom but in order to get it i'm going to dominate you and take away your freedom mm. it's it's interesting to me um like when you think about uh states you know um it's like uh when when Typically, you you say, okay, well, states' rights. You know, use typically conservative philosophy ideologies about state rights is right of the state, and yet you have to be in control of the state so you can control whatever it is. So there's there's different kinds of freedoms that you're talking about. Right. It all depends on who you are, where you are. That's why I think too, it's like, um, you know, a, 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 a state that's very Christian. Mm -hmm. or has a lot of Christians, so the Southeast, like uh, right. Alabama or Mississippi or whatever, you're gonna see a lot more of this than you're gonna see in Oregon or Wisconsin, I mean, uh, you know, some other state, yeah. right? Because the percentage of Christians are gonna be tied in more. Mm. Uh, and so this Christian nationalism is gonna rise up, I think, even more. Mm. Um, <laughs> so think, think for example, do you remember the, um, do you remember the, the 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 case with the cake the guy was asked to make the cake for the oh, gay couple oh yeah. yeah 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 was that Colorado I think, it was, I think so it was in Colorado I think it was in Colorado anyway um, the guy the guy was asked to make a cake uh, for this gay couple right he used a religious kind of exemption. So like Anabaptists, for example, Anabaptists are pacifists, they're exempt from military service, but they're not exempt from paying taxes that go to pay for war. You know, some of them do it, they still have to like go to jail or pay the right. price. I mean, you, religious exemption doesn't get you off of everything, get you off for certain things. So he used this, um, he said, no, I'm not gonna make a, an accommodation for this. All right, you know, I'm not making you guys, I don't believe in that religious right religious so it went through all the courts and actually all the colorado courts sided with the couple but then went to the supreme court and they sided with the baker right because they thought that the state had used um what's the term they thought they were biased 
uh, in the language mm -hmm. that they've used. So it wasn't so much about the merits of the case, like a lot of things. It was like the, yeah. there was bias in the process, yeah. therefore whatever. And so you think about, all right, here's his religious, um, his his religious uh, exemption, right? He 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 felt strongly, so he's religious. But in order, unlike Anabaptists, you know, who might not pay their taxes and then they have to pay the penalty or have their land taken away from or whatever, they don't go seek remedy from the power of the state to fix the problem. They just realize I'm going against the grain here and I'm gonna be persecuted for that. I'm willing to be persecuted for that, right? right? Martin Luther King Jr., I'm willing to break the law and if I break the law, I'm gonna to go to jail. I'm willing to go to jail. Yeah. I'm not, right. not willing to try to skirt the rules or right. whatever. And so there's that thing, and I'm not saying that's right, wrong, or indifferent. I just say it's interesting to point to and think about how Christians put so much, um, how, how we put so much trust in the state, the power of the state. Right to remedy us or, or what it is that we feel infringed upon. But then when it comes to someone else's infringement, um, we don't give the same leeway. Right. Does that make sense? It does. And so uh, one of the things it's like, I think you say, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invoke the state to protect my rights because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm doing this for my witness. But then I have to ask myself by invoking the state, bringing in the courts and all this kind of stuff. Doesn't that, isn't that worse witness overall for everything that's happening mm -hmm. in the world? If you're trying mm -hmm. to, if the purpose is being a witness and you right. bring in the courts. Um, and I wonder, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm that. asking the question. No, I think it's good because in some ways what you're asking is what are we bearing witness to? And if as Christians, we are bearing witness to a different type of power that is in operation in the world, then the state is a neutral thing that um, that I, I want to be involved in and all those kinds of things that kind of provide structure and all those. But if that becomes the way that I am seeking salvation, the saving of a way of life or the the, the um, of something in a terms that then then it becomes a symbiotic relationship with um, with 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 God, it becomes my God. And what I'm hearing, at least in what you're saying, is that um, we are to be bearing witness to a different power and principality that is operation within the world in- Truth. Yeah, in this love. <laughs> Truth. So we've, 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 we've chosen power mm. and effectiveness over truth and excellence. Mm. Um, you know, the last thing that it's Stephen Long who writes this book, and he's from uh, SMU, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but anyway, he he talks about how um, that in the Holy Communion liturgy. This is the last thing I'll say. In the liturgy for Holy Communion in the Methodist Church, it says, "We have not loved you as we should. You know, with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor. We have broken God's law. We did not hear the cry of the needy." Right. And then it says, "Free us." For, joy. for joyful obedience. Yeah. Free us huh. for what? Joyful obedience. Huh. Then think about freedom and obedience. How they. Yeah. So we are free as Christians by obedience. And Augustine says the will is unfree if it follows its own directions without a graced direction and so what he means is if you've grace is not turning your heart in all things it turns it inward and then we get back to the beginning of this whole conversation which is um you know it's emotion it's just what i think what i feel about whatever mm. right and i can go online to social media and find any kind of data to, to back up my emotion that i want but that's not truth right. and that's not fact Right? Does it make sense? It does. It does. And so, as I, the, the reason this book was um, interesting to me is because it, it's saying, it, it kind of put to words, um, it, I think there's a place for us to have a broader conversation with people mm -hmm. who are really struggling to have, figure out, like, where do we fit as Christians in this? Yeah. And so, rather than try to understand it through history and wisdom, right? Finding truth, you know, joyful obedience, and we fight. Yeah. We fight, and if this church is not going to defend my opinion or emotional place where I am on this, then I'm going to go to a church that will. 
Yeah. And there'll be plenty of churches that will. Mm-hmm. Because again, there's this whole strand of, I think, corrupted Christian theology yes. that's rooted in power. stuff that's not biblical. That's it's power. this dominion, yeah. right? right? Where these seven mountains, the seven kings, uh, you know, will be in control and there'll be earthly authorities and they won't be perfect people, right? <laughs> they'll be flawed characters. And why would they flawed? Because they can win and I want power. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. think about some of these. I mean, Ronald Reagan was not a church going guy. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm not even talking about Trump. I'm just talking about go back to, to that. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy Carter was way better at articulating his faith and theology yeah. and revelatory and humble and humility. But guess what? He couldn't win. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's right. Power was the choice. So religious right, you would think the religious right would uh, align more with someone like Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Who still to this day teaches Sunday school at yeah, yeah. Plains, Georgia. You can go down to the little Baptist church down there and you can show up and there he is, 90 something years old, That's and he's amazing. still in the sanctuary teaches Sunday school. Class. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know. Um, well, I, I think that's what um, I continue to hear, at least you call us to, and other people um, that we're kind of um, interested in talking with and kind of um, um, being around in that. Um, the gospel of Jesus bears witness to uh, a third way, a different way. And it is one that is encased within truth because what we say is that um, there is a truth and it's it's in the way of Jesus mm-hmm. uh, that, that leads us. And he also says um, uh, that he will lead us into all truth, right? Mm-hmm. And so that there's a leading of that into a place that where we're both giving up this worldly power, but we're taking on the humility and the truth of God, which is uh, many times service and love. That's the, a, uh, yeah, the reason I like the conversation is um, if you re- if you are a Christian and you're really willing to go deeper yeah. and have a conversation to understand how we are in this world, right? We we belong to two cities: yes. an earthly city <laughs> and an eternal city. Yeah, and we don't get to uh, just live only in one. That's right. We have to live in both. Mm-hmm. And so, to me, it's like this: this is not when people get upset. Like, well, I don't want you talking about politics. Okay, that's fine. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about Christianity. Yeah, I, re- I mean, I'm talking about how Christianity operates in the midst of the reality we live yes. in, which yeah. is a political society. Yes. But I, I'm not really talking about politics. I'm talking about Christianity. So when people get upset thinking that, you know, you said, so I'm like, let's have a conversation about how Christianity intersects with this. And let's just don't just synthesize it down to, well, I'm, I mean, I, I've had people tell me I'm a one issue voter. It's abortion. That's it. Mm. And so I will vote for, you know, that you might have the most upstanding the person in the world, yeah. most upstanding Christian person in the world, but if they're, you know, pro-choice, not vote for them. I'll vote for this horrible human being, right? Mm. Because I'm a one, and I'm thinking, all right, well, it, 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 if that's if that's the only reason that you make a decision, it's like was it Piper or somebody uh, basically came out and said, I can't vote for. I mean, this guy, I thought, I don't really sub- to subscribe to this guy's theology, but he was the guy that came out and said, I'm not voting for Joe Biden because I'm pro-life and I will not vote for someone yeah. who's pro-choice. Yeah. He goes, but I, as a, as a Christian pastor, I will not vote for Donald Trump. Hmm. I cannot vote in good conscience for him. And he went down all the, yeah. the things. He's like, I, I can't do that. And I encourage Christians not to, Christians not to do that. Mm. And so when I say that to people, they're like, well, you're just wasting your vote or whatever, right. you know, whatever. Um, and I go back to that thing. It's like, well, what are we choosing? You know, what is our public witness in this moment? Mm. Um, I think we need wise leaders. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. I love this There's conversation. There's not many out there. No. Well, I love I love this conversation. These people don't run for office. Uh, would they? Why would no. they? I mean, when you think about, so if you go to Plato and he's like, you know what, we need a philosopher kings. We need wise yes. leaders. And I'm thinking someone who's sensible and wise and has like intelligent conversations like we're having here. First off, I don't know that they'd ever get elected. And second, can you imagine how miserable that would be? Yeah. To well, be Because you're divesting of power to try to serve, right? And that's a, it's a whole other algorithm. <laughs> whole other set of practices you got to be bulletproof ben (laughs) 
like literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what else we got, Jeff? All right, so this is just a this is a conversation about faith and life and you know um, stuff that I. These are these are conversations that I'm I'm having one on one with people yes. who are really in a tough place. Yeah. They're struggling with things going on in yeah. the world. This is the kind of conversation we need to have at a broader level. We haven't been able to because of pandemic. And yeah. I think like when you think last year around racial issues and political issues yeah. and pandemic issues and all these things, we were so disconnected. We weren't able to sit down and have these kinds of conversations yeah. with people. No, that's right. So the podcast it becomes a way for the two of us. To, to have a conversation uh, with that people can listen to over listen over here on, yeah. and hear that it's not a one line demonized you know yeah. uh, bullet point clickbait yeah. whatever that there's a lot to this yeah. that needs to be fleshed yes. out and talked about and to say that as well not everyone is going to agree with the way that you line that out and that's okay this is part of what this is about is having a generous conversation where we're struggling together right? yeah but i will say i will say to sound a little haughty on this um is that you know if you're if it's, it's very different if i'm depending on who i'm having a conversation with that's right. right. If somebody right. wants to have a conversation right. with me on Facebook and they're not a Christian and not in a church, okay, I know what the rules are. <laughs> but if you're a member of the church or you're a Christian and you 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 call Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, that's right. And the Bible is the Word of God that you follow and live by. Yes. Then we have a set truth that we operate off. That's of, right. That's right? right. We have shared language. Yeah. And at some point, you know, you're going to have to listen to this and go, okay, but. Right. Well, that's fine, but let the butts there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Sometimes um, the big butt. And I hear people all the time when they talk about things like, uh, you know, same-sex marriage. Right. For example, that's the Bible's clear. That's wrong. And I bring up, well, what about divorce and remarriage? I mean, uh, we remarry. There's a lot of remarried people in the church. We we haven't we haven't split the church over yeah. that. And yeah. Jesus talks more about that and is more clear on that than in gay marriage. It wasn't even gay marriage in the, in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. But they'll, and so when I try to explain, well, the reason why some people are open to gay marriage is because we've made a graceful accommodation around divorce and remarriage, that this, none of this is, none of this is turned out the way God wanted it to originally. <laughs> We're kind of living in a Genesis three world. But then they say, well, just because, you know, that's, that's wrong shouldn't make this right. And I'm thinking, well, if we follow that logic, then the same thing holds true about like politicians we vote for. Yeah. yeah. You know? Right. If you, you, you can't be a one item voter where that one item aligns with your faith, but all these other don't. It's like, does it make sense? Yeah. I'd be more in line with Piper who says, no, you don't vote for either one of them. <laughs> if you can't vote for the pro-choice guy, I get that. But you don't vote for this other guy or, or gal or whoever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they totally are just yeah. antithetical to Christian yeah. faith. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, that's all I got to say about that. Jenny. That was a tight. All right. You, well, well, so go ahead. No, I was just going to say I'm John Stevens. And I'm Matt Russell. And I was going to say Pod Have Mercy. Well, welcome. Welcome.